go ahead and read through um, just the whole chapter, just all four paragraphs. We'll read through that together, and then, and then we'll begin. Uh, the confession states that temporary believers and other unregenerate people may deceive themselves in vain with false hopes and fleshly presumptions, that they have God's favor and salvation, but their hope will perish. Yet those who truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love him sincerely, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him, may be certainly assured in this life that they are in a state of grace. They may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and this hope will never make them ashamed. This certainty is not merely an inconclusive or likely persuasion based on a fallible hope. It is an infallible assurance of faith founded on the blood and righteousness of Christ revealed in the gospel. It is also built on the inward evidence of those graces of the Spirit about which promises are made. It is further based on the testimony of the Spirit of adoption, witnessing with our spirits that we are the children of God. As a fruit of this assurance, our hearts are kept both humble and holy. This infallible assurance is not such an essential part of faith that it is always fully experienced alongside faith, but true believers may wait a long time and struggle with many difficulties before obtaining it. Yet with the enabling of the Spirit to know the things freely given to them by God, they may attain to this assurance by using ordinary means appropriately without any extraordinary revelation. Therefore, it is the duty of all to be as diligent as possible to make their calling and election sure. In this way, their hearts may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, in love and thankfulness to God, and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience. These effects are the natural fruits of this assurance. Thus, it does not at all encourage believers to be negligent. True believers may in various ways have the assurance of their salvation shaken, decreased, or temporarily lost. This may happen because they neglect to preserve it or fall into some specific sin that wounds their conscience and grieves the spirit. It may happen through some unexpected or forceful temptation or when God withdraws the light of his face and allows even those who fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light. Yet they are never completely lacking the seed of God, the life of faith, love of Christ and the brethren, sincerity of heart or conscience concerning their duty. Out of these graces, through the work of the Spirit, this assurance may, at the proper time, be revived. And in the meantime, they are kept from utter despair through them. And may the Lord bless our study this evening. Amen. All right, we're well, coming back into the confession this evening. You recall uh, last time we began this 18th chapter on assurance, and in that we covered the first two uh, paragraphs. That we just read along with the third and fourth. Uh, from them, we saw last time the scriptural truth that our assurance of grace and salvation is certainly possible. Along that, we saw that it can be misrepresented, uh, misrepresented as well uh, in those that have a false assurance. And then, along with that, uh, along with the possibility of assurance, we also covered the truth that true God-given assurance is certain, and it is, um, it is infallible. It is infallible. It's not you know, some blind hope or something like that. In the church, it's not some blind hope or fleshly presumption as a false assurance is, because our assurance, first and foremost, is not based upon us, but it is based, as the confession says, it is based upon who our God is for us in Christ Jesus. It's firstly based upon him and his sufficient works on our behalf. So as the second paragraph of this chapter begins, uh, this certainty is not merely an inconclusive or likely persuasion based on a fallible hope, but it is an infallible assurance of faith founded on the blood and righteousness of Christ as revealed in the gospel. So church... Is the blood or the death of righteousness or the, the blood and righteousness of Christ revealed in the gospel certain? Is the blood, the, the death and righteousness of Christ infallible? Well, yes, it, it, it certainly is. Absolutely. Uh, will Christ and his works in redemption uh, ever come up short to accomplish that which he seeks to in the utter and complete salvation of his people? Will it ever come up short? No, it will not. Uh, never will it do so. Church, for by a single offering, he is perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified, Hebrews 10, 14. A, once for all, a single offering, he's perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified by him. And thus, those who have truly drawn near to God through him can be assured of that very thing. They can be assured that they will be sanctified and perfected for all time, as the scripture teaches. And it's all because of Christ. Again, it's all because of him, because he did this by his single offering. He is the one who is bringing this about in our lives. He has offered up himself once unto death for sinners, the righteous for the unrighteous, that we would 
uh, not might or possibly, or I hope so, but that we would be brought to God, 1 Peter 3.18. And church, as I stated last time, we as his people, enabled by the grace of God, have the ability to read that in his certain infallible word, to then believe it, receive it, and have a certain infallible hope of our salvation based upon our Lord's certain infallible death for our sake. Hebrews 7.25, he is able to save to the uttermost. He is able to save completely those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And thus again, as one of his own beloved, I can be assured myself that I will be saved to the uttermost as well. And looking to him, finding my all in him, and what he has and will continue to accomplish on my behalf as one of his whom he has granted uh, the ability to believe upon him and to trust in him, receive him as Lord. Then along with that, brethren, and how Christ and his sufficiency actually affects our life through faith, uh, you remember the confession continues out from our assurance being founded upon Christ to the inward evidence of the graces of the Spirit about which these promises, speaking of the promises of the gospel in Christ, about which these promises are made, and as well that it is further based on the testimony of the Spirit of adoption, witnessing with our spirits that we are the children of God. So going along with our belief in Christ, as I mentioned then, that's really getting into the fact that those who are truly in Christ have their desires changed. Right? They're now new creations in Christ. The old has passed away. The new has come in Christ. Newness of life has come to be lived out by the Spirit of God who's come to glorify Christ within our hearts and minds. So church and dwelt by the Spirit, true Christians love Christ. They desire Christ above all things, and because of that, they no longer want to live in rebellion to Christ. They no longer hate or reject him as they did when they were unconverted, and they no longer want to live in ways in which he died for. He died for our sin. We don't want to live in ways that put him on the cross. But now out of their love for him, now and being converted out of their love for him, they desire to seek to serve him in their life and to think the way that he would have them think from his word. They, they want to take every thought captive unto obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Which, going along with this, is why after expressing in the first chapter that those who have a false assurance have such because it is founded upon false hopes and fleshly presumptions, you know, just according to their own opinion, just according to their own imagination. Well, I feel like me and God are good. It's not based on the truth of his word and what God actually says in his word. The confession then states of those with this certain assurance, this infallible biblical assurance, yet those who truly believe in the Lord and the Lord Jesus and love him sincerely, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him, they may be certainly assured in this life that they are in a state of grace. Certainly assured that they are. They may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and this hope will never make them ashamed. Why will the hope never make them ashamed? Because the hope is certain and it's infallible. And, and what they're hoping in in Christ will come to pass because he who promises in his word will bring his word to pass, and he who has accomplished his sufficient salvation will save us to the uttermost. And so as we addressed in all this last time, yes, we can have an infallible assurance based on the infallibility of our God's promise in his word, the infallibility of Christ's blood and righteousness in the gospel, and then how that has truly affected our life by the work of the Spirit and conforming our lives to these gospel truths and promises, we can certainly have this assurance. But then now as we get into the remainder of this chapter, we do find the biblical truth that not every true Christian who does actually have true saving faith, we're talking about someone who's been born again, they're a real Christian, they're converted, not every true Christian has this assurance, possesses it in their heart and mind at all times. And in acknowledging this, the third chapter of the confession begins in saying, this infallible assurance is not such an essential part of faith that it is always fully experienced alongside faith, but true believers may wait a long time, struggle with many difficulties before obtaining it. And so the confession is expressing here that someone can, again, actually be a true believer, actually reconcile to God through saving faith in Jesus Christ, while at the exact same time they, might, they may not be completely assured about that faith that they have, that they are actually reconciled to God in Christ. Some can actually be a true believer, church, and not have the assurance that they actually are. You know, I quoted 1 John 5.13 uh, last Wednesday to show that this assurance is certainly possible. Right? I write these things to you who believe that you may know that you would be assured that you have eternal life. So there we see that assurance is possible from that verse. 
But the implications of that verse show us as well, church, that it is possible for a true believer to not have that assurance. Because what does he say? Again, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And so for John to even write that, beloved, there must be a category in his thinking in which someone who does truly believe in Christ, as he says, truly believes in the name of the Son of God, while at the same time not know or be assured that they have eternal life, that they've truly been reconciled to God in Christ, that the faith that they have is salvific. Someone may ask from that, and it's a good question, but someone may ask, well, how can that be? How could that actually happen? How can that be? And in answering that question, I'm going to jump down to the fourth paragraph of this uh, because the beginning of the fourth paragraph answers it uh, verbatim. It says, he recalls, we read through it before, true believers may in various ways have the assurance of their salvation shaken, decreased, or temporarily lost. This may happen because they neglect to preserve it or fall into some specific sin that wounds their conscience and grieves the spirit. It may happen through some unexpected or forceful temptation or when God withdraws the light of his face and allows even those who fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light. And so there's different things there that the confession pulls from Scripture on why this could be that someone could be a true believer and not possess uh, you know, just a fullness of assurance at the same time. And the first one that it notes is neglecting to preserve it. Neglecting to preserve it, that is a big one. Um, I would say, especially in our day and age, and just the absence of many biblical churches that are uh, that are you know are not even discipling their members correctly, it's why many new believers may not even be assured that they're actually a believer because they're not being discipled or held accountable properly in the church that they're in. There's several things that we're dealing with here in the contemporary church. For one, with the popularization of this unbiblical idea that was popularized through Charles Finney that preaching can only be considered successful depending on the amount of converts that happen through it, that preaching is only successful if you're getting people to walk the aisle and so forth and making professions of Christ. Well, from that, there has been in many an evangelical church a complete cutting in half of the Great Commission, just making it about professions of faith and having, again, people walk the aisle and so forth, raise their hand, you know, come down and pray a prayer and so forth. And, and with that church comes the real fact that no true sheep of God are really getting fed in a lot of these churches as they ought to be. They're not getting fed as they ought to be. They're not getting discipled as they ought to be. Because since their pastors are more worried about getting people to make a, a decision in the church's worship of God, they're more worried about the unbeliever in the church's worship of God. They don't truly put all of their focus on just actually worshiping God. They don't put all of their focus on faithfully preaching his word and in that training up and properly feeding his people as they've been commanded to as a pastor. They're, they're not actually doing that because they're more focused on other things that God's not even told them to be focused about in the worship service. Then along with that as well comes the sad reality of the total absence of any biblical church discipline or, or loving accountability going on in many contemporary churches today, uh, you know, really going on whatsoever, where people are actually being held accountable for how they are living their life in accordance with the commands of Christ, People aren't being held accountable to the, to the word, to actually uh, follow Christ and have their life match their profession. And so, beloved, because of this, many churches today are, are, are either not helping or aiding their members to continually have a true assurance, right? They're not teaching them properly in this, or uh, other than that, they are actively producing false assurance and false believers is what they're doing. They're... They're, they're aiding others, they're aiding the sheep of God to neglect to preserve this assurance. And so within neglect being a reason for a lack of assurance, I'm simply bringing up for our contemporary day that one reason that a true Christian, an actual believer, may neglect this to seek to preserve their assurance is because they haven't even been taught what it means to actually live the Christian life. They're ignorant of it because they haven't even been shepherded the way that, that their pastor has been called to shepherd them. They haven't been taught biblically how to put sin to death and live under righteousness from the word of God and how their God would have them. And in that, nor have they been held accountable to do so. They haven't been, I mean, because in, I think many of us know who have been in other church contexts, there are people who just live in open sin in some churches and people are just not being held accountable. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, a little leaven leavens the whole lot. And so this is, this is you know, one of the reasons. From that, you could definitely have a true believer who has not attained their assurance 
Because though there is true belief and faith in Christ, though there's true love for Christ in that person, there is still much sin that's going on and not being put to death, and they're not being helped on, you know, what to do about that. But then apart from that, even for us here in a church that does seek to do that, right? Okay, so we are seeking to disciple properly. We are seeking to teach how to put sin to death and live to righteousness. We are seeking to hold one another uh, accountable in accordance with the word and, and teach one another how to obey all that Christ commanded and not uh, cutting the great commission in half, but to seek to fulfill it. Even for us in that, it is still greatly important for us to take hold of the means of grace. It is still important for us to not to ne uh, neglect to preserve our assurance. And if you don't know what I mean by means of grace, the means of grace are the reading of the word of God, uh, prayer, fellowshipping with the church and the word, gathering together with the church on the Lord's Day in corporate worship and everything that's included in that, uh, preaching, singing, corporate prayer, the ordinances, baptism, the Lord's Supper. These are all means, church, means or, or avenues through which our God strengthens us in the faith, uh, through which he works in us that which is pleasing in his sight, that we would from that uh, work our salvation out with fear and trembling. And thus, church, and actively participating in, in the means of grace, that strengthens our assurance as well. He strengthens our faith, strengthens our assurance. I'll uh, give you just an example from prayer in John 15, 7. The Lord Jesus says, if you abide in my word and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Right? That's a means. He, you know, we, we understand from the word of God that his, sovereign, that his grace is sovereign. We understand Philippians 1, 6, that he who begins a good work will complete it. But he didn't say there, for example, but even if you don't ask, it'll still be done, right? That, because he's going to complete it through means. And as he says there, it, prayer in accordance with his word is one of them. Storing up his word in our hearts so that we might not sin against him. Uh, Psalm 119, I don't remember the exact verse. Is it around seven? I don't know. I'm not going to say it on that. Psalm 119 something. Your word I have stored, I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. He says, if you abide in my word, my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done. And that's in the context of the good works that we will perform for him, for the fruit that we will produce for him. And so church, if we're neglecting his means of grace in any way, then sure, we can and will lose our assurance in different degrees. We can and will lose it if we're, if we're neglecting the means of grace, neglecting to preserve it. Uh, and that can definitely happen especially in our context here in America where there are so many distractions, so many entertainments that can uh, plead to our flesh for our time, can appeal to our flesh for our time. And church, if we get caught, uh, caught in that and wasting our time in different ways and you know, we then begin to neglect daily Bible reading, neglect daily communing with God in prayer, uh, neglect maintaining a good conscience with judgment day honesty, we just basically begin to live out our days through the week just as anyone else does in this rebellious world, you know, as though it is actually our day alone instead of the day that our Lord has given us to glorify and enjoy him in, to obey his commands in, to love him in. Well, then, yeah, yeah, we can, we can most definitely begin to lose our assurance. Sure, because in different ways, we're not even actually thinking and living Christianly in those days as we ought. We're not thinking Christianly. We're not living Christianly. We're, we're thinking like the world apart from him and just living our day however we want to. And so while someone's lack of assurance may surely come from ignorance, much of it as well is going to come from sin in different ways and not making the best use of our time. That's a big deal, making the best use of our time. Because much of this can come from not making the best use of it. As the confession further mentions along with this, it can happen through some specific sin that wounds our conscience and grieves the spirit. Or it may happen through some unexpected or forceful temptation. You know, for example, you have a true believer who's been wasting their day playing around on social media and YouTube and stuff. Not that those things can't be beneficial in their time. I'm just saying this person's been scrolling all day watching reels and different videos. And, you know, they, they haven't been using their mind at all. They've just been disengaged and just wasting their whole day. Well, not only would that be sinful, church, because that's definitely a waste of time in the day that our God has given us. But, you know, just as well, let's say, for example, that this is a man and all of a sudden, and you know, this uh, is not out of the norm that this could happen with the, the pictures that people post, post on Facebook and, and videos that are on there as well. Let's say that he's scrolling. All of a sudden, as they're scrolling, a half-naked woman comes on their screen. 
they scroll up and they see this, this image. It's an unexpected temptation. They weren't expecting this to come about. It came upon them as they were doing this. And because they haven't been thinking and living Christianly that day, not in communion with God, but just living the day for themselves, well, what is he going to do? Uh, well, he, he's probably going to do what he's been doing the rest of his time, which is to, to continue to not think Christian. He's probably going to give in and watch or look at it for longer than he should. And unless there's a great God-given repentance there upon that happening, what's going to happen is that their assurance is going to be shaken. Because why would a Christian do that? Really, why would a Christian do that? That's not Christian behavior. And that's just one example, but, but in different ways, the same type of thing can happen in, you know, in different aspects. We can waste our day not thinking Christianly within, and then some unexpected circumstance. You know, someone talks to me in a certain way, or something happens in my life. I find out something happened that is uncomfortable to me or something like that. I can waste my whole day not thinking Christianly, not making the best use of my time, not beginning my day in prayer, as we mentioned Sunday, you know, just waking up and starting the day and, and getting on with it. Then some unexpected circumstance comes upon us, and we don't respond Christianly because we were sinfully not doing so in the time leading up to it. We weren't thinking Christianly when it happened. And then it happens, and then we continue in. And so, church, that's why the Scripture is abundantly clear that we must always be awake in our walk in the Lord. Uh, we're not to be spiritually asleep. We're to be vigilant. Vigilant. We're to always be serving our Lord in whatever we do. Whatever we do, we're to seek to glorify God. We're to take every thought captive, not just some of, some of them or some of the time. Every thought is to be taken captive to obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if we don't church, all we're doing is we're simply aiding ourselves into putting ourselves into a position to lose assurance to some degree. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 3 to 10. I'll read through it. 2 Peter 1, 3 to 10. God's divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. There's another means there, through his promises, through his word, we escape. We escape from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. But going out from this, because this is true, Peter says, for this very reason, make every effort... Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. He says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, if you're, if you're making every effort and, and you're really doing this and you're seeking to grow your faith, grow in the knowledge of uh, in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. There's different ways you can read that, but that definitely sounds like a lack of assurance. If you have been cleansed from your former sins and you forgot, you don't have that assurance. Why? You're lacking these qualities. You're not seeking to supplement these things to your faith. You're not seeking to grow in the knowledge of the Lord and, and preserve it. You've forgotten that you were cleansed from your former sins. He says, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Right? That language was in the confession. Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Because if you practice these qualities, you'll never fall. If you practice them, you'll never fall. You'll never uh, lose your assurance. And thus, if we don't consistently practice these qualities, we will. We will have a fall. And so we must church and we must encourage and hold one another accountable in this to consistently seek to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. To, again, fulfill the Great Commission, to teach one another how to obey all that Christ has commanded us. Known sin Surely, uh, known sin in someone's life is always going to hinder assurance. You know, if we're not consistently seeking to keep his commandments, then the assurance that we have actually come to know in Christ uh, in salvation is going to be greatly harmed. Right? I, I mentioned 1 John 2, 3 last uh, Wednesday. We can know that we've come to know him how we keep his commandments. So if I'm not consistently keeping his commandments, that's going to shake me. 
That's going to shake my assurance. It's going to make me wonder, what, you know, what's going on here. Just as well, if we're not loving the brethren. If we're not loving the brethren, actually joining together, serving a local church as God has ordained, then, you know, our assurance is certainly going to be shaken that we passed out of death into life. Because 1 John 3, 14, as I mentioned last Wednesday, says we can know, we can be sure that we passed out of death, in li- out of, out of death into life because we love the brethren. And so, neglect of means... And sin in our lives is definitely a reason. But in taking hold of God's means of grace, as I've already said, that that shaky assurance, beloved, can be put to death and replaced with true biblical assurance. That that shaky assurance can be conquered by true biblical assurance in putting our hand to the plow and not looking back. Along with that, after the third paragraph began in stating that assurance is not always accompanied by true saving faith, It continues in saying, yet with the enabling of the Spirit to know the things freely given to them by God, they may attain this assurance using ordinary means appropriately. This is the means of grace we're talking about, preserving it, without any extraordinary revelation. You don't need someone to come to you, you know, outside of the Word of God or something like that. You can have it without that. Therefore, it is the duty of all to be as diligent as possible to make their calling and election sure. In this way, their hearts may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Spirit and love and thankfulness to God and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience. These effects are the natural fruits of this assurance. Thus, it does not at all encourage believers to be negligent. It doesn't at all. Why? Because I want that joy in the Holy Spirit. I want that that peace and joy. I want that love and thankfulness to God. I want that strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience. Instead of being in that, with you know, not sure, not confident, in despair. And then along with this, and before I mention the last reason that the confession gives for why a true believer's assurance may be shaken, I will say uh, as well that this can happen, you know, from someone being sinfully too self-focused. That can happen. Someone being sinfully too over-scrupulous upon their life. Someone can get in their mind, church, that the presence of any sin at all means that they're probably not a believer. Or, you know, if they're not as bold as someone, or they're not as gifted as other people in the church or something like that. And they can sinfully take that and shake their own assurance because they're looking way too much at themselves and they're not looking not ne- as near enough at Christ. They're not looking at Christ as they ought. They're just really just looking at themselves. You know, unfortunately, and, and we definitely want to fight sin and make no provision for the flesh, But yes, we're we're being perfected, we're being sanctified, so sin is going to happen. And so church, it's not the presence of sin altogether in any form that is the problem for our assurance. The problem comes in what we do with the sin that's going to shake our assurance. Are we justifying our sin? Are we seeking to repent from it? Are we putting it to death? Are we fighting it? Is there actual godly sorrow there and not just worldly sorrow? Am I actually sorrowful that I've sinned against my God and my love, my Christ and my love above all things? Is their godly sorrow. And then along with this church, you know, our Lord did teach very clearly in the parable of the sower. We'll see this when we get into Mark 4. But in Mark 4, verse 8, he does say that those of the good soil, meaning these are true Christians we're talking about here, true believers, those of the good soil don't all bear the same amount of fruit. They don't. Um, You know, some bear 30-fold, some bear 60-fold, some bear 100-fold. And so, you know, everyone can't be like me and bear a hundredfold. It's, it's just not going to happen. You know, I'm just playing. I, I, I don't believe that I bear a hundredfold. But the thing is, is we don't all bear the same amount of fruit. It just doesn't. Some bear 30, some bear 60, some bear a hundred. There are going to be believers who bear less fruit and who aren't as gifted as others and so forth. And that has nothing to do with whether you're actually a Christian or not. A Christian bears fruit. The 30-fold is just as much a Christian as the 100-fold. The person who's not the Christian is the zero-fold, is the no fruit. No, no, nothing for Christ. So, you know, don't, I just, I just want to encourage anyone who may have that kind of disposition, you know, to be over-scrupulous or hyper, hypercritical of yourself, to quit looking at you so much and look at your blessed Savior. Don't, don't look at you so much. Look at Christ. Look at Him. Behold His wonderful face and His perfections and redemption. Because as has already been said, right, our assurance is always firstly founded upon who? Him. Not you, not me. Him. Christ. 
And then how, then from that, how he has affected your life. So if you are actually seeking to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord out of love for him, while you are actually dealing with and seeking to put sin to death, then, beloved, don't rob yourself of a blessed assurance simply because you're not perfect. Don't rob yourself of that because you won't be perfected until our Lord returns. What we are is not yet. It will only be when he returns, when he comes. We will all deal with sin in different degrees because we're not all fully sanctified yet. And so the question is more on what our disposition towards sin is. What is your disposition towards sin? Uh, where, you know, what are you actually seeking to do about it? What are you seeking to do about sin in your life? And then, you know, also why, why are we doing what we're doing about it? Why are we seeking to, to deal with sin in a certain way? Because it should always be out of a supreme love for Christ and the desire to glorify God in him. Not for, not for some other, you know, external reason. I just want people in my life to be happy or something like that. It should always be for Christ. But then lastly, as I read earlier, the, la the, reason, the last reason, the, uh, the confession does state that our assurance can waver through the sovereign ordination of God. Uh, there in the middle of the fourth paragraph, it states that it can happen when God withdraws the light of his face and allows even those who fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light. If you want an example of that, uh, that kind of language in Scripture, uh, Psalm 30, verse 6 to 7, speaks of that with King David. David says there, uh, As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, I was dismayed. You, you hid your face. The light of his face was taken away. You hid your face, I was dismayed. And so, and what David experienced there, uh, there was what John Bunyan would call in the Holy War a, a carnal security going on. Uh, too much of a self-confidence, right? I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. Too much of a self-confidence. And in disciplining him in that, the Lord hid his face from him. David not, did not feel that comfort of being in a right relationship with the Lord. Church, there are different psalms in which you can see men continually seeking the Lord continually crying out to God, continually seeking him, yet still troubled in their soul and not being comforted. You look at Psalm 42, Psalm 77, some examples in that. What we see from that, from those Psalms, what we see from that is that the Lord does at times do this to his own children and it's used by him to grow us, to lean more upon him and to seek his face even more, to grow in him and to seek him even more than we already were. It's used to compel us to seek his face, to, to be even more steadfast in prayer than perhaps we even already were again. And as in David's case, church, it may not be from a known or comprehended self-reliance uh, that we have, you know, but our loving Father, church, who knows and sees all can and may bring something like this upon us simply to grow us out of a self-reliance uh, that we may not even recognize, but that he does, but that he knows that we have, that he sees within us to grow us more in the faith, that we would be conformed more into the image of the Son, that we would share His holiness in a greater way. Church, this, this can happen through different circumstances, uh, hard times coming upon us, times of despair, times of opposition coming upon us, times in which we just don't feel as confident in our relationship with the Lord. We just don't feel as close with Him. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but that can happen. From that, we are then moved by these situations to diligently seek his face, just as we see from these men in these psalms. And I'll encourage you in this, if you, if you go through this, get some, get some encouragement in the fact that if it does move you to seek him, then that should build up some of your insurance, your assurance. Because an unbeliever wouldn't seek to uh, be moved to seek him in that. An unbeliever wouldn't care. Someone born again wouldn't care. But someone who is born again, filled with the Spirit of God, loves Christ, when, when, when they're faced with such a thing and they don't feel that, that comfort from the Lord as much, that's going to move them to seek him. That's going to move them to prayer. That's going to move them to being in the word because they don't, they don't want to experience that any longer. As the psalmist says in Psalm 42, I'm going to continue to hope in God, even though I feel this way. I'm going to continue to hope in him. So, you know, in, in, in all this, you know, still, any wavering of assurance is going to be from sin in some aspect. Uh, it's just that it can either be brought upon us by our own neglect, uh, whether that's willful or ignorant, 
or it can be sovereignly brought upon us in a special way by God to show us our sin and our need to grow in certain areas of life as well. Uh, maybe areas of life that we don't, you know, don't even acknowledge at the time. But in light of that, church, this is why we are always to be heeding the command to make our calling and election sure. Always heeding the command uh, to make every effort to supplement our faith with all of those things that Peter described. Virtue, knowledge, brotherly love, steadfastness, and so forth. We're to always be doing this. And as servants of our sufficient king, beloved, uh, we can do so even through the worst of times. Uh, through any circumstance, we can do this regardless of how we feel uh, in, in any circumstance in the moment. And knowing the truth that even in times when our assurance may be greatly shaken, our sufficient God in Christ Jesus, who began a good work in us, will indeed complete it. He will do it. He's promised he will do it again. Christ has given up himself once, and he perfects us for all time. And he will accomplish his work in his people. We can, we can face anything knowing that he who began this good work in us will complete it. And church, with that, the fourth paragraph, after stating the, the different reasons on why someone would lose their assurance, it ends in saying, and I quote, yet they are never completely lacking the seed of God, the life of faith, the love of Christ and the brethren, sincerity of heart, or conscience concerning their duty. Out of these graces, through the work of the Spirit, this assurance may at the proper time be revived. And in the meantime, they are kept from utter despair through them. And so, brethren, with everything that's been said, uh, may we keep our hand to the plow, uh, continuing to move forward in, in service to our Lord, to his glory. And may we keep our hand to the plow. May we look to our blessed Savior. And in that, may we make every effort, striving with all his energy that he powerfully works within us through the means of grace, through the indwelling of the Spirit, May we make every effort to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to encourage each other in that way as well. And to him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen? Amen. That will conclude our look at this chapter. Uh, next week we will begin chapter 19 on the law of God. And apart from any comments or questions, we can begin our review.